4, and this is, is really kind of the end part of the letter. He, it's, it's kind of the closing part of the letter, and so uh, the message is on Sunday evening sometimes a little bit more um, teaching. Uh, of course, it's preaching as well, but we're, we're kind of picking apart the chapter a little bit more, and so we're going to do that a little bit this morning as we go through here, really verse by verse as we study through uh, this letter uh, that Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica. When we get to chapter 4, uh, Paul's going to compare the Christian life to a walk. And Paul often used this illustration. It, it seemed to be one of his favorite pictures uh, or favorite comparisons to the Christian life of a person walking. And truly, the Christian life, it begins with a step of faith. There had to be a time that you took that step of faith and said, I, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. And if you've never done that, then we encourage you this morning. I prayed just a moment ago that if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, that today uh, you would take that first step. And so when we talk about the walk of the Christian life, it begins with one step. It begins with a step of faith that I am believing Jesus Christ died for my sins. I'm putting my faith and my trust in him, realizing I cannot get myself to heaven but I am believing that Jesus can, that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. The gospel, that he shed his blood to pay the price for my sins. When we get saved, that's what we're doing. We're placing our faith in him. We're believing that he can save us, and that's, that's the first step. And then many times we talk about uh, baptism being the next step, uh, that you follow the Lord in believer's baptism. It's an outward sign of what took place inwardly. Uh, when we baptize, we baptize by immersion here at our church, uh, meaning that a person is put all the way under the water. So they, uh, we say, I, bury, or I uh, baptize you, my brother or my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. And it's a, it's a picture of what Jesus Christ did for us, that he died, he was buried, and he rose again. And sometimes at the end, uh, we'll say to walk in newness of life. And that's taken from the scriptures, that once we get saved and once we get baptized, now God wants us to walk in newness of life. God wants us to live differently. Uh, the Apostle Paul uh, in 2 Corinthians, he said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so this, this Christian life, this walk of faith, it is a, it's, a, it's a walk in a different direction. Uh, we, we use the word repentance. And repentance, uh, we say that faith and repentance are necessary for salvation. Repentance, the, the word literally means a turning around. And so we were going one direction. We were going away from God. All of a sudden we realize I need to be saved Jesus Christ can save me. I'm putting my faith, my trust in him, and we turn toward God. Well, now that we've turned toward God, now that we're going a different direction, God wants us to continue to go that direction. Um, he, he says that he's molding us and making us into the image of his son. Not that we're going to be perfect, not that we're going to be sinless. We never will be on this side of heaven, uh, but we ought to be trying to sin less. We ought to be trying to be more like Jesus Christ each day of our life. And so that is uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The moral climate, uh, kind of the, uh, the historical background here, or the setting for this letter, the, the, histor the moral climate in the Roman Empire was certainly not a spiritual one. And that's been characterized in, in movies and in uh, television series and in books. Uh, they, they were very well known for their wickedness, uh, very well known for their, their lifestyle of, of sin that they lived. Kind of anything went and, and just any kind of pleasure, any kind of uh, uh, fulfillment that you wanted, uh, that was the Roman Empire. And the Christian message of holy living was going to be a message that was new to them. Uh, Christianity was new. Jesus Christ, just uh, less than 100 years before, Jesus had, had, had died on the cross. Now Paul's going around on these different journeys. He's preaching and telling people about Jesus Christ. They're putting their faith and their trust in him. They're receiving him as their Savior. But now this new teaching was that now you are to live differently. 
You're to think differently. You're to talk differently. You're to dress differently. You're to treat people differently. And this idea of holy living, this idea of Christian living was, was very new to them. Now, it's not a new teaching today in the year 2023, but it's a teaching that has fallen out of popularity. Uh, the popular message of Christianity today is that you can be saved and we, we live under grace and so you can live however you want because God has extended his grace to us. Now that sounds great and that appeals to people because after all, who doesn't want to be saved and then live however they want and do whatever they want and say whatever they want and go, however, go wherever they want. But the problem is it doesn't, it doesn't really line up with the Bible. The Bible very clearly tells us that there are things that we should do and there are things that we shouldn't do. It very clearly tells us that there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. There are things that please the Father and there are things that grieve the Father. And so Paul writes here and he's going to encourage these new believers in holy living. And the first half of this chapter, what we read for our text, verse 1 down to verse 12, that, that paragraph uh, it, it gives us a threefold walk for the Christian to follow. And this applies to every person in the room, from the youngest to the oldest, from the person that's, that's the newest saved to the person that's been saved the longest. It is for everyone. A threefold walk for the Christian to follow. Number one, he says we are to walk in holiness. And this is where he really spends the greater part of this section, from verse 1 down to verse 8. And, and it's, uh, it's very clear from the context and from the uh, cultural background why he spends so much time on holiness. Because they lived in a place and a climate that was anything but holy. Well, I think that could apply a lot to modern day America, 2023, right? We live in a time and a place that so many times is anything but holy. Uh, the television, uh, uh, social media, uh, the, the clothing, the music, the entertainment. Uh, we, we would say it's, it's anything but holy. And yet, God very clearly says we are to walk in holiness. Why are we to walk in holiness? Well, Paul gives four reasons. Uh, his first reason is because it pleases God. It pleases God when we walk in holiness. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us, how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Now, on, in, in the area of salvation, and the area of being a, a child of God, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, right? God made us his child when we, when we put our faith and our trust in him, when we receive him as our savior. It's, it's nothing that we can do. It is all of God that we are saved. And so in that regard, when it comes to us being a son of God or a child of God, uh, there's nothing that we could do that would cause God to love us more. There's nothing that we could do that would cause God to love us less, because he, he died for us. He sent his only begotten son to die, to be buried, and to rise again. And when he forgave us, he forgave us of all of our sins. Past, present, sins that we've not even committed yet. He, he paid for all of them on the cross of Calvary. But in our fellowship with God and in our daily living with God, there are things that we can do that please the Father. And here Paul tells these Christians that when we, uh, when we walk holy, it pleases God. And so just as today, it is not easy to fight against temptation. Uh, there was temptation everywhere around them. Paul was very aware of that. Uh, Paul knew of the things that were there in their cities. He knew of the things that went on in their cities. He knew that temptation would constantly uh, be surrounding them. He knew that temptation would constantly be pulling them away from God. And it is the same today. But the Christian life is not about pleasing yourself. When you're saved, it's not, well, I, I'll do whatever I want and I'll say whatever I want and I'll go wherever I want because it's all about me. And that's what culture says. But what we find out is that the Bible is, is really very often counter-cultural. Whatever direction culture and society is going, the Bible is usually the opposite way. And, and here, uh, for these uh, Christians, uh, they had to realize that the Christian life is not about me, it's about God. 
the, the Christian life is not even first about pleasing others. The, the major motive should be to please God. And so let me give you a few scriptures here. Romans chapter 15 and verse number 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. I think if there's one point that we get out of the message this morning, perhaps this would be it. Uh, that life is not about pleasing me. Because we need to hear that and we need that repeated because everything in society tells us just the opposite. Everything in society tells us it's all about you, and it's all about you, what you want. And you only live once, and don't let anybody tell you what you can do, and, and do things that make you happy. And we hear those kinds of expressions all the time, but the Bible says we're not to please ourselves. Galatians 1.10, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Right? It's possible that we can get so wrapped up in pleasing people that we're not really living in a way that's pleasing God. We're, we're pleasing our family, or you're pleasing your spouse, or you're pleasing your kids, or, or you're pleasing your coworkers, you're pleasing your boss, you're, you're pleasing your, your neighbors, you're, you're pleasing your friends at school, you're pleasing your teacher, right? We can go on and on and on. We're trying to make everybody happy, and we're trying to keep everybody happy. But Paul said, uh, For I, uh, if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Eight, chapter, John chapter 8, verse 29, He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. If you look that scripture up and you have a red-letter Bible, uh, you would notice that those are the words of Jesus Christ. Jesus said that. Jesus said, John eight twenty nine, And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. And so our supreme example, Jesus Christ, he said, I do always those things that please him, that please the Father. And so here's a question that you and me need to ask ourselves, and that is, am I living to please God? Am I living to please God? Now, before we answer that question too quickly, sometimes we hear questions like that and, and we just, we're, real quick, we want to nod our head because we're in church, right? And, and people might see us. And, and we might, if we're nodding our head, then they think, yeah, look at them. They, they're wanting to please God. But the truth is, many times in our life, we're not living to please God. We're living to please me. What I want what I want to do, where I want to go, what I want to watch. And, and I can say that because we, we have very little time for this, but we have a lot of time for this, right? And, and so we're on our phones and we're on tablets and we're on, uh, we're on television and we're on all of these things, but when it comes to reading the Bible, we say... Well, Pastor, I, I know I know we ought to read our Bible, but I just, I just don't have a lot of time. I'm just so busy. Why? Because we're living to please ourselves rather than living to please God. You say, well, I just, I just don't have time to pray. I, I know friend day's coming up, and, and I know the church has been saying invite somebody and, and, and invite your neighbor or invite your coworker. Uh, so be, ask somebody to be your friend that day. Uh, encourage your friends to come to church. Tell them about the, the pumpkin. But I, I, just, I just didn't have time this last week to invite anybody. I, I wanted to, and this week I'm going to try. Because we're not living for God, we're living for ourselves. Sometimes we have better intentions. We say, well, I'm, I'm just, I, you know, I had, to, I had to do this. My wife needed me to do this, or my husband needed me to do this, or, or the kids had this going on, or uh, at work, I had to work a lot of overtime. What are we, we're talking about pleasing others. And Paul said, if I, if I please them, then I may not be able to please Christ. And so am I, am I living to please God? Number two, he said, walk in holiness to obey God. That's another good reason, isn't it? Because God has told us to be holy. In verse 2 and 3, For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. And that word commandments that he uses there in verse number 2, it was a, the, the Greek word, it's a military term, and it, the idea behind it was orders handed down from superior officers. 
and anybody that's been in the military or had family maybe that's been in the military, uh, when you get orders from superior officers, that there, there's no, there's no if I want to. No, if you got orders, you're doing it. Right, and that's the that's the word that Paul uses here. These commandments, in other words, they're not suggestions, they're not ideas. It's not if it's convenient. No, there are things that God has told us, and we're either obeying or we're disobeying. And when it comes to living holy, it's not it's not if we want to or not. We we throw around the word preference a lot of times. Well, it's just it's just my preference. No, God told us here that we are to live holy. It's a commandment from God. We're to live different. That word holy means to be set apart. Now, uh, while pleasing God is more than obedience, we must obey him in order to please him. Now, I understand there's, there's more to pleasing God than just obeying. You can, be, you can be doing everything outwardly, following the rules, and inwardly, the apostle, or, uh, Jesus looked at the Pharisees and he said, you're whited sepulchers. You look good on the outside, but you're dead on the inside. And, and I get that. I know that you have to, that it, is, it is about motive too. But in order to please God, you do have to obey him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so it's not an either or proposition. Well, I, you know, I'm not going to be worrying about pleasing God. I'm just going to worry about what's, what's on the inside, that I had the right motives and the right heart. Well, the right motives and the right heart is good, and it's important. But obeying God is also good, and it's also important. It's not one or the other. They're not mutually exclusive. They're actually woven together. That we ought to obey God and we ought to obey him out of a right motive. And he gives a specific here, a specific that was very common in their culture, abstain from fornication. Abstain from sleeping with people that you're not married to. Right? That, that's what fornication is. Fornication is, is having sex before you're married. It was very common in his culture, and, and, and so Paul didn't avoid the subject. He didn't bury his head in the sand and say, well, I'll just pretend that I don't know what's going on. No, he said there, there are things that are going on here in our city. There are things that are accepted in our culture that they are not right. You're to abstain from it. Uh, abstaining from sexual sins is a direct commandment from God. Again, it's becoming more and more common to, to live together, and, and it's more and more accepted in the church that, that people are living together. They're not married yet, but they're, they're living as a husband and wife. But we are to abstain from sexual sins. Uh, more and more common that people have affairs, and, and they say, well, that's just kind of how life is, and people make mistakes. No, as a believer, we are to abstain from sexual sins. If you're not married yet, uh, you, you shouldn't be sleeping together and acting like you're married. We are to abstain from sexual sins. And Paul here gave very explicit uh, uh, commands to the people because he said these are things that we're to obey. So letter A, to please God. Letter B, to obey God. Letter C, to glorify God. We're to walk in holiness because it glorifies God. Verses 4 and 5, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. Now, this is the positive side of the commandment. We, we heard the negative side of the commandment, what not to do, and this is why we should do it. The, the why of why we should do it is because it brings honor to God. It glorifies God. We're to glorify God in our bodies. He said, it talks about possessing your vessel there. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And say, because I'm the vessel of God. Because the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of me, I want to glorify him with my life. I want to glorify him. I want to honor him with my body. And the idea here is, is uh, that we are to please God. We are to bring glory to God in the way in which we live, in the way in which we behave. And then lastly, he says to escape the judgment of God. That's the fourth reason, to escape the judgment of God. Verses 6 to 8, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, 
because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given us unto us his Holy Spirit. And Paul, Paul spent a great deal of time on sexual purity because it was a serious problem. And I believe in the year 2023, and in America, we would have to say that it is a serious problem in our culture as well. And, and it's affected the church just like it's affected every, everywhere else. But God has very clearly called us to live holy. Now, what, what did I say just a moment ago at the beginning of this point? I said it's not easy to live holy. It's easy to give in to temptation. That's what's easy. All of us, when we're tempted, uh, we say, oh, I like that. Okay, I'll go do it. That's easy. What is difficult is saying, my, my flesh wants to do that, but I know it's not right. I can't let myself go over there. I can't let myself watch that. I can't let myself be around that. I have got to say no to my flesh. I've, I've got to avoid temptation. And there's not a person in here that doesn't struggle with temptation. Now, we may not all have the same temptations. Different stages of life, different temptations. Men and women, different temptations. Young and old, different temptations. But all of us are tempted to do wrong. And you can be sure the devil knows how to tempt you. And the devil knows how to tempt me. And, and we've got to avoid temptation. We've got to say no to temptation. It still is today, whether it's fornication, sex before marriage, or adultery uh, outside of just the husband and wife, uh, divorce, pornography, pornography, a multi-billion dollar industry. And, and they are so, uh, the way they go after target demographics, target ages, uh, friend requests from uh, females get friend requests from men, say little things on their Facebook page. Uh, men will get friend requests from women, say little things on their, in a direct message. Uh, emails, uh, have, have you looked at my pictures? Uh, did you see these? I think you would like these. Right? We, we live in a society where it is just, it, it is an epidemic problem all around us. And, and used to, that was a, a male problem, it seemed like. Uh, statistically, they say male and female just about as much. Um, the, the statistics are, are alarming and startling when, when it says the age group that has seen a naked body is getting younger and younger and younger because of smartphones and tablets, iPads, uh, social media, all the different uh, video sites and, and picture sites. Right? That, it's, not, it's not easy to say no to that stuff. But as a believer, as a Christian, we are to avoid those things. We are to keep ourselves pure before God. We are to live holy. Uh, homosexuality, uh, the Bible says it, it's an abomination for mankind to lie with mankind as, as with womankind. Right? There are things that uh, socially are acceptable, culturally are acceptable, but the Bible that was written thousands of years ago has not changed. Jesus said, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never perish. And this is not a new message that I'm preaching. And In fact, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the Thessalonians 2,000 years ago. And I'm just reading the letter and making comments on, on what he wrote, what was a problem in the Roman Empire, and it's still a problem in the United States of America. And, and yet, Paul said, as Christians, as believers, as followers of God, we are to live holy. We're to live holy. We're to live set apart. We're to live different. Colossians 3, 23 to 25, What so we do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of your inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Just because we're forgiven of sin doesn't mean we're exempt from the judgment of sin. Right? You say, well, I'm, I'm forgiven. If I go out and rob a bank, uh, God forgave me, uh, but you, you're still going to face the time when you get caught by the police and, and get tried before a jury, you're still going to go to jail. And, and, and that is true of every sin, whether it's alcohol, uh, whether it's drugs, whether it's immorality. There are consequences to sin. 
There are consequences to our behavior. James says, And lust, when it is conceived, bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And the word James used there is a very general term for the word sin. He wasn't naming a, a specific sin that brings forth death. No, he said sin. Generally, all sin brings forth death. And so there are consequences to our sin. So number one, and, and that was the longer part of the message, walk in holiness. Number two, walk in harmony. Walk in harmony. Look at verses 9 and 10 here. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, you do it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. And Paul now makes the transition from holiness to love. And the transition from holiness to love should not be a difficult one. right? We, we should be holy before God, but we should love our brothers. He, he just talked about sin. Sin that, that, that was going to be judged by God. Sin that had consequences. But you know what he follows that up with? But love. Love. Right? We, we, as, as Christians, we ought to always remember we are not to hate the sinner. Right? That, it, it, as, a, as, a, as a child of God, if you are saved, you are still a sinner. You're just a safe sinner. Uh, but, but you say, all I am at the, at the very best, all I am is a sinner that's been saved by grace. But, but for the grace of God, right? We, we could be just like, and so we say, I, I love my fellow brother. I love my, I love my fellow human being. I, I love them. Even though they, they sin, even though they do things they shouldn't do, I, I love them and I, I, I want to love them. And, I, and more importantly, I want to show the love of God to them. And we miss the mark greatly when we only preach the first point and not the second point. Hey, what it, what is going to affect a change in a person's life? Only one thing uh, can really uh, truly change a person, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That when Jesus comes into a person's heart and forgives them of their sin and saves them, and Paul knew the power of the gospel. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And so these people that were in sin, he said, we need to love them. Why? Because we need them to listen to us so that they can hear Jesus loves them. And if, and if we walk around just hammering and hammering and hammering and hammering, then, then nobody's going to want to listen. Right? You can say that sin is wrong, but God loves you. You can say that's not right, but God wants to forgive you and that we are to live in love. The more we live like God, the more we will love one another. Think about that. The more you live like God, the more you'll love like God. The more you'll love one another. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.3, remembering without ceasing, Here's what Paul had said at the very beginning of the letter, your work of faith and your labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. In chapter 3 and verse 6, But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. And in verse 12, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Well, Paul said it over and over and over. We're to love. We are to love. We are to love. You know, we live in a world where people feel unloved. Uh, we were in the hotel this week uh, and went down for breakfast one morning and, and the television there was playing and, and it, was, it was the news early in the morning and, and they're talking about different things and and they they start they had a man on i didn't catch the title of who he was but the 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 headline for that interview was he he was being inter he was being interviewed about uh the 10 to 14 age group committing suicide and that that increasing and how much that has increased since covid and and this man was some kind of a doctor uh that was was talking about the problems and, and he was linking it to uh, social media. And he was saying that social media has played a lar has been a contributing factor uh, to these 10 to 14-year-olds committing suicide. 
why, why is that? Because people don't feel accepted, because people don't feel loved, because people don't feel like they belong. You know, if anybody is going to show love, you know who, who should? A Christian, a child of God, one that has been forgiven of their own sin. Says, say, I know all about Brandon. I know everything about me, and God so loved the world, God so loved me that he forgave me of my sins. And you know what that ought to do? That ought to cause me to love other sinners and want other sinners to know this is how you can be forgiven and this is how you can be accepted because you may not be accepted by all the groups you want to in this world, but you know who will always accept? God. God loves us and God wants to forgive you. He was not writing to them to get something new. He was, he was encouraging them to get more of what they had already enjoyed this was not new this this love was something that they had already done but you can never have too much christian love we're to live holy we're to love you say well i love i i do love people well you can love them more that's the idea that's what paul was saying here you, you're not going to love people too much you're not going to show god's love too much it was something that they already had but they could do it even more the difficulties that we believers have with one another are opportunities for us to grow in our love. And, and that's a great quote. I'm, I'm not sure exactly uh, who said that. But the difficulties that we believers have with one another, and one another are opportunities for us to grow in our love. You see, many times we see problems, and that's all we see is a, is a problem. But understand that God puts things in our life that are difficult because he's wanting to teach us. He's wanting to develop you. He's wanting to grow you. And, and so many times God knows he's not going to grow you past this point until you go through something that's difficult where you learn to trust him. Maybe it's a person that's difficult. But God says, I'll, I'll give you uh, mercy. I'll give you grace to help you through this situation. And then let me give you the last one. Walk in honesty. Walk in honesty in verses 11 and 12. And we'll go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without, that you may have lack of nothing. He, he makes here, uh, takes them one more step. Uh, to teach them that we are to be an example to others, an example to others. The emphasis is on the believer's witness to those outside the Christian fellowship. So there, there are times that Paul talks about loving the brethren. Here he's talking about loving those that are without. Right. So this love, this, uh, this testimony, this walking honestly... Uh, notice, notice there in verse 12 that you may walk honestly toward them that are without. Not other believers, not other people in the church, but people in the community. Neighbors, people that you go to school with. They don't go to church. Uh, they may not even be saved as far as you know. But you want to walk honestly toward them that are without that you may have lack of nothing. It's important how we live and behave in front of unbelievers. Now, it, just as you say, I don't know if that person is saved... They ought to be able to say about you, I don't, I don't know exactly what being a Christian is, but I know they claim to be a Christian. You know, people that you go to school with ought to know you're a Christian. Uh, your neighbors ought to know you're a Christian. Uh, people in the community ought to know that you're a Christian. And many times they can tell that you're a Christian. They can tell you're a Christian just by the way that you're talking or, or the way that you look. Or maybe even the places that you're at. They say, I, I, I believe they're a Christian. Some of you are going to go out to eat those, uh, this afternoon after church. We're going to dismiss from here. And you're going to go somewhere to dinner. You're going to go to buy dinner somewhere. And, and you know the waiters and waitresses and the cashiers, it's very likely that they, they may not know what church you go to, but they know you went to church. Why? Because it's about noon and it's a Sunday and you're kind of dressed up. And they're like, oh, they probably just came from church. You know what? Many times waiters and waitresses say they, they say the, the rudest group or the rudest time to serve is Sunday right after church. Now, isn't that a sad testimony of Christianity? The, 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 the most difficult people to work with, the most difficult people to try to serve and keep happy are the people that just came from church. No, Paul says that you may walk honestly toward them 
that are without. It is important how we live and how we behave in front of unbelievers. Not just when you come to church, when you go to work tomorrow, when you go to school tomorrow, when you go to Walmart, and you say, that's, that's going to be a t- trying one. Just walking into the Walmart, I'm already just pulling into the parking lot. I'm already, I'm already getting tried here. But, but we that we would walk, we would walk honestly. Why? Because people are watching. You know, I I never know who, who it is that I'm going to see at Walmart or Tractor Supply or Kroger that I'm going to knock on their door and say, "Hi, we're from Good Shepherd Baptist Church," and and they may never say it outwardly. But you know what they could say in their mind? Oh, I, I remember that face. I remember that guy with the red hair. I, I, saw him at, I saw him at the grocery the other day. People are watching. We live in a small town. People, people know you. We tend to go to the same places over and over and over. And you know, we ought to want to invite those people to church. That, that girl that just served us our lunch or the guy that just brought our refills, uh, we ought to invite him to church when we're done eating. Uh, the person that uh, took our money at the gas station or at the grocery store, we ought to invite them to church. It's hard to invite somebody to church when you act like a jerk, when you lost your temper, uh, when you got angry and you blew up because something wasn't just right. And by the way, you want to come to our friend day on October the 8th? No, we're not, we're not going to invite anybody to church because we say, I, I can't invite them to church. Why? Because I wasn't living honestly. I wasn't walking honestly. Specifically, he deals with testimony and financial matters. They were to live in honest living, not have any debts. Uh, plainly, their Christians ought to pay their bills. Uh, we need to behave especially well, especially well before unbelievers. Colossians 4 or 5, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. It is a repeated theme that the Apostle Paul wrote about, that it, how we live amongst those that are without, those that don't go to church. That matters. Paul, Paul wanted these new believers to learn to please the Father, to please the Father. I, I, I trust that every person, uh, here in just a moment, we're going to have an invitation. We're not doing it right now, but here in just a moment, we'll do it. I'll have everybody to stand, bow your head, close your eyes. The pianist will come. They'll start to play through uh, some music. And I'll, I'll say, how many of you know for sure that you're saved? Would you raise your hand? And, and, and then I'll say, if you don't know for sure that you're saved, would you raise your hand? You know, I believe every, every person that raises their hand, I know I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven, ought to want to please the Father. You say, because I'm, because I'm saved, I want to please the Father. Well, how do you do that? You walk in holiness, you walk in harmony, and you walk in honesty. We walk in holiness in order to please God, in order to obey God, in order to glorify God, in order to escape the judgment of God. The, uh, the obedient Christian will have a holy life by abstaining from sexual sin, a harmonious life by loving the brethren, getting along. Right? Don't you like when people get along? You know how we get along? By loving people. Love, the Bible says, covers a multitude of sins. When you love people, you say, I, I, can look over, I can look past that. I can overlook that. That's not really that big a deal. Love covers a, a multitude of sins. Our kids might do something that might aggravate or frustrate. But you know, right after that, you say, but I love them. But I love my kids. We ought to have a love for others. And then an honest life by working with our hands and not interfering in the lives of others. I'm talking about spiritually. Right? God's trying to get that person to him. Let's not get in the way. If we're gonna if we're gonna do anything, let's help get them to God ourselves, but we sure don't want to get in the way of what God's trying to do in their life. Let's live in such a way that the Father is pleased. Let's go ahead and stand this morning if you would. Ask you to bow your head, close your eyes just for a moment. We're gonna have that time of invitation that I was talking about, and that's a time when we invite you. Uh, to do business with the Lord. We uh, invite people to come to the front, up at the front of the church here. These altars, you can, you can pray and you can talk to the Lord. The most important thing we always try to invite people to is that if they've never been saved, we want to give you the opportunity to be saved. How many of you this morning, with heads bowed and eyes closed, you could lift your hand and say, Pastor, I know that I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven. Can you lift your hand to that? I know that I'm saved. All right, amen. You can put your hands on. That's a, that's a wonderful testimony. 
That's a great thing. By, by knowing that you're saved, what you're saying is, I know one day I'm going to heaven. Not because of anything I've done, but because I put my faith in Jesus. And in Christ alone, I ask him to come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, and save me. Maybe this morning you, you, you can't say that. You say, I don't know for sure that I'm saved. But while nobody's looking, nobody's talking, you just slip your hand up just, just where I can see it, just so that I can pray for you this morning. That's all I want to do. I just want to pray for you. Say, I'm not sure that I'm saved, but Pastor, I'm thinking about it this morning. I'm not sure that I'm saved, but I'm thinking about it. Is there anybody like that? All right, amen. You can put your hand down. I appreciate your honesty. Maybe this morning there's one that you'd say, Pastor, I, I want to live in a way that pleases the Lord. I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I, I think that would be every person in here. I want to please the Lord. But sometimes as we hear the Word of God preached and as we read the Word of God, we, we see there's some things that we could do better at. We see that there's some things that I need to, I need to work on. Maybe it's some things that I, I need to start doing. Maybe it's some things that I need to say I need to quit doing. But I want to be pleasing 